ik ben Wessel Simons van Bitcoin Magazine en we zitten hier met uh, uh, Brian Ein uh, Gordon Einstein. Uh, le let me start with a short introduction. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Gordon Einstein. I'm an attorney who specializes in blockchain and crypto law. I'm based out of Los Angeles, New York, and Kiev. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say is I'm on my, I'm on my first European tour of 2018. Cool. And I've been to Miami, San Francisco, uh, Kiev, now Amsterdam, then London, then Los Angeles, then Utah, then back to Los Angeles again. Okay, so, sounds good. You just did yeah. uh, the session about the law, eh? uh, the law and ICOs. Yes. Maybe you can uh, pinpoint out a few highlights of that of that presentation. Uh, sure. The, um, there's an interesting global conversation happening right now, and it, it really is global. Mm -hmm. It's <clears throat> when you have these ICOs. There's a question about whether or not the tokens that are being issued as part of that ICO mm -hmm. qualify as securities. Mm -hmm. or the other term is utility tokens, yeah. whether they qualify as securities or utilities when issued. Mm -hmm. And there's also a wrinkle in there um, that's based on what a law firm came out with called the SAFT agreement, which is it's possible that even if a token will eventually be utility and not security, mm -hmm. that's going to be a security while the platform is being built. Okay. In other words, if someone's one of these ventures is trying mm -hmm. to start a blockchain-based company, mm -hmm but they haven't built the platform yet, if they sell tokens to raise the money to build the platform, yeah. there's a question about whether or not those tokens are securities at least while they're building the platform. Okay. And that's not a sure thing. That's the subject of some controversy. Mm -hmm. But right now, the way the world is tending is that they're, mm -hmm. at least into the American market, which we can talk about, yeah. they're not issuing the tokens right away. They're using something called a SAFT. A SAFT. And okay. a SAFT is Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. Mm -hmm. It's based on mm -hmm. something called a SAFE, which is Simple Agreement for Future Equity. They okay. just kind of brought it up okay. today for SAFs. So I'm globetrotting the world trying to explain how this all works, Yeah. educating, asking questions, and having good conversations. Okay. And uh, if you compare it to, uh, you also uh, advise clients uh, outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Are there, what would you advise for uh, European ICOs to raise money in the U.S.? So the, the point I always feel like I need to make to make it because this is this is a global market right now mm -hmm. is the two largest national economies and I'm being careful how I say that because the EU is I would call it a super national economy mm -hmm. the two largest national economies on the planet right now are China and the US and it's unclear which one's first because yeah. you know, currency adjustments and everything else but those are the two largest mm -hmm. at the moment you can't legally conduct an ICO in China that may change sure. but that's the moment so the largest national economy on the planet is the United States in terms mm -hmm. of what's available for an ICO. Yeah. I think it's a real mistake for startups outside of the United States mm -hmm. to be afraid of raising money inside the United States because they're afraid of United States securities laws. And I yeah. understand why they're afraid and I talk about it, but mm -hmm. if you look at an ICO mm -hmm. uh, or if you look at a token generation event, to ignore the biggest national source of capital yeah. when you're doing it is a mistake because then someone with your exact same model come in, can come in right behind you who's not afraid. They're later in time, but if they go to that market, and and raise, they can raise more money. Yeah. Also, when done correctly, an ICO is a marketing event not just to raise capital, but for your platform. Yeah. I true. mean, ideally, the, the whole point of this is to build platforms. Well you have a huge national economy and customer base in the United States. If you don't raise, don't let your ICO touch there, yeah. you're missing on that marketing opportunity. 300 million people? Yes. Total, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and huge market. growing every day. <laughs> actually, <laughs> you actually yeah. have, you know, a population growth happening. Um, and the economy is growing. But, you know, just in general, it's a huge... <clears throat> you can't be too picky. You know, it sounds kind of funny, but you can't be too picky in this world because, you know, with China banning ICOs and with different jurisdictions like South Korea, which are crypto friendly, but being yeah. putting in new regulations, you need to go where the money and the customers are. And US securities laws are not designed to stop innovation. Mm. There's actually part of the law that says that the SEC needs to foster capital formation and innovation. It's part of their okay. mandate. Okay. In like 96, that got added to the Securities Act by Congress. They're not just there to get in the way. And they're very cautious despite all the news, they're very cautious about stopping things that are legitimate. Okay. They don't really stop things that are legitimate. Don't stop innovation. Uh, they can't. No. They because, can't. you know, there's there's an anecdote I like, which is the 
in the United States, the, the place you go to form a company uh -huh. is Delaware. Okay, oh, yeah. it, it used to not be Delaware. It used to be New Jersey. Okay. And then New Jersey put in more restrictive laws under Woodrow Wilson, of all people. Okay. And then all the companies reincorporated in Delaware, and then they never went back. Okay, so I think that's on everyone's mind, that you, uh -huh. you can't, there's at least something legitimate and forward-looking and positive about blockchain, whatever the excesses are of the market. And no one wants to be the fool that chases it all away so that it never comes back. True, true, so true. They're, they're finding a bounce right now, which is kind of interesting. And uh, for instance, when you have a Dutch ICO, what would you advise them uh, uh, to, to, to start uh, raising capital in the, in the US? I mean, do they have to apply to a lot of regulation? Or they don't need to apply to a lot of regulations, mm. but just in general. So there's mm. there's almost like a decision tree. Yeah. If, if your tokens, even once the platform is built, is going to be a security, i.e. an investment or investment contract, then that's a whole different ball of wax that's very complicated and I can't possibly communicate in one interview. Now, It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of time. time. It's a lot of money. You have to usually register with SEC, Securities Exchange Commission. Register is a... Yeah. the word they use okay. um, and you then have a chance of going public which is a whole different set of reporting requirements Sarbanes-Oxley all that stuff mm. but in reality it's unusual for a token to intentionally be a security these days there's a place for it but to be a security you know, you're basically giving away equity or debt in a company you're yeah. maybe sharing out governance you're maybe paying dividends you're yeah. not commissions mm. it's unusual mm. right now okay. the usual scenario is that People are building a usable platform, like Ethereum, for example. Yeah. And they're issuing tokens in order to fill, in order to fund the building of that platform. But once the platform is built, the tokens are not expected to be securities. They're suspect, they're expected to be uh, utility tokens or consumable items or products or, or goods. So, like, like I mentioned yeah. before, yeah. The, the issue mm -hmm. is that build process. Well, if you're a Dutch or non-US uh, startup, yeah. it's perfectly legitimate to raise funds in the United States. You but just you don't want to do a general offering. You don't want to do a public offering. You want to do what I call a, a SAFT raise. Yeah, the SAFT raise. Okay, right. okay, okay. And there's nothing such like in Europe, like a SAFT, uh, agree a SAFT agreement or SAFT regulation. Uh, you know, I, I always work with local council on, the, on mm. these issues because there's, there's inconsistent rules in Europe, which is part of what makes it so exciting and fun. Yeah. You know, you have the national level, you have the EU level, yeah. community law, and then you have interesting what I call border areas. So Gibraltar yeah. is an example of an interesting border area. It's a U.S. overseas territory. Yeah. It's part of the U.K. in a sense. Yeah. The U.K. has Brexit, and there's a lot of um, home rule aspects to Gibraltar. Okay, okay. So they're putting in the Gibraltar uh, blockchain exchange. They're actually creating, you know, a formal method for trading blockchain assets. It is quite a favorite uh, destination for blockchain companies. Uh, Gibraltar, that kind of. Uh... It, it is, and it's going to be more so soon. Okay. So there, there's a couple interesting aspects of what they're doing. They, for them to accomplish what they want to accomplish, they mm. need to implement and perfect their statutory or legislative structure mm -hmm. for blockchain assets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure where they are in that process. I, I know they're reasonably far along. Uh, there's some really good law firms there that are working on it. And okay. I know Nick Cowan of Gibraltar Block Exchange, Exchange, and he's working very hard to get the law perfect. But mm -hmm. there's sort of the technical side of it also, which is they have a neat concept, which, which is if you're doing an ICO mm -hmm. and you work with a local sponsor and you do it the way that they say to do it in, a, in alignment with their law, mm -hmm. if you do an ICO in that manner, you will then automatically have the right to get listed on the Gibraltar blockchain exchange. Okay. So for every other company in the world, doing an ICO and getting listed on exchanges is two separate actions. It's quite interesting. To yeah. Do that. I mean, they're combining them, mm -hmm. but you have to have a compliant ICO. Which sounds is, good. Yeah, it sounds very good actually. Um, and you know, and there's different approaches. The, mm -hmm. You have say Estonia or some other countries that are sort of laying off regulation or maybe are friendly. In regulation, also yeah. the Netherlands the, the, well, tend to be quite friendly. Or I honestly don't know yet. I'm exploring. Okay. okay. But I, for better or for worse, the Netherlands is not known as a hotbed of ICO startups. It may be a hotbed of blockchain, but you don't yeah. hear about ICO after ICO after ICO coming out of the Netherlands. You, you do hear about it coming out of Zoom. We have decent bet who is now established in Panama 
and uh, he's thinking of uh, establishing in Amsterdam. But well, I had this discussion. I mean, this has been a great conference. I had this mm. discussion yesterday. The the Netherlands has a beautiful history of capitalism, commerce, and what I would call contracting for civilization. Mm. I mean, you know, the the whole idea. One of the speakers was talking about one, the, the whole idea of a share in a company. Mm -hmm. I gather originated here, That's and true. the idea of options and futures. You know, whether or not they were came up here, they were highly implemented here. I mean, this is this is a capitalist, you know, seafaring, trade-oriented country. You know, mm -hmm. partly because of geography, partly because of the nature of the people, partly because of the cultural and historical background. You know, with the Protestant work ethic and everything else. Yeah. The yeah. it's it's made for this, yeah. but it's yeah. also an interesting situation because it's part of the EU. And so you have to comply with EU broad law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and a Nexit is not happening. So mm -hmm. a Nexit like a Brexit. No, is I don't not think happening. a Nexit is happening. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so you know, I, I don't I don't know where the EU is going to end up in 20 years. Mm -hmm. you know, is it going to be bigger, smaller, different, whatever? But I'm pretty sure Netherlands is staying inside. No, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a great entrepreneurial culture, but I don't mm -hmm. I am not personally aware of the Netherlands uniquely implementing legislation that would give it an advantage over, say, Estonia. Yeah. 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 But that doesn't mean it can't. It just you know maybe you know maybe it just needs to get move further along down that path. What kind of advantage has Estonia? You have a digital ID by birth, mm -hmm. for for example. Are you aware of? Yeah, there Estonia. Estonia, I think from the get go, mm -hmm. from you know the, when they broke up from the Soviet Union, just from the start, mm -hmm. um, they, they had the advantage and disadvantage of being able to reinvent their systems because the prior systems they just let go behind. Yeah, and. But they also had the advantage of quickly, you know, joining the EU, unlike say Ukraine or other countries that were in the same, in the same situation. Mm. They, they right from the start went to sort of a digital model of government and governance yep. and yep. economy and ID, and it's the nature, it's sort of that Scandinavian mentality of you know just clean, efficient, non-corrupt, yep. you know, get yep. stuff done. So they're innovative. They're, they're very innovative. Um, they also have a low corruption environment. You know, so if you look at all jurisdictions all across the world, there's you know, obviously some place that's very corrupt, you're not going to do business, but there's ones that have higher reputations and lower reputations. Mm -hmm. Estonia just has a reputation for being very fast and efficient, mm -hmm. and they are really breaking, they're, they're just pulling ahead for the moment. And what now, can we learn? What can other countries learn from Estonia or maybe Ukraine, where you're also based? Um, it's a great question. I think what they can learn mm -hmm. is... Blockchain is not all perfect, and ICOs are not all perfect. There are clearly abuses, and the abuses, law. Abuses? What kind of abuses? Sorry. To people interrupt. selling these tokens, promising the world, not delivering, taking the proceeds, having fun in Ibiza. Um, it's unregulated. It's unregulated. You know, and human nature is unregulated. And when you have regulatory dark, you know, black holes, people are going to do things. So there, there's a reason for regulation. It's okay. We're supposed to have it. I think where. Countries that are innovative, and I don't want to overfocus on Estonia, this, that, and the other, but just in general, when, in general, when yeah. countries are responsible and have a rule of law and aren't the Wild West, they, they, they have the regulatory structure, and that's okay. I'd say it's a couple things. It's the reg it's the regulators recognizing that something potentially good is happening here and having a conversation with people rather than slamming down the law. So it's a little bit of an attitude thing. Yeah. The second yeah. part is there's a concept of a regulatory sandbox, mm -hmm. which is we're not going to take this thing we've created and let it into the wild yet, with God knows its genetic component you know, infecting the world, <laughs> but we'll create a, a sandbox, a test environment, yeah. where we can try out these ideas you know, the right, you know, in participation or in collaboration with the regulators, and then take what's good yep. and release it out there. So you see that in Estonia, you see that in some other places. In Ukraine, you have, a, like I said, Ukraine has the benefit and the cost of having a system from before that which they had to completely get rid of and build from scratch. Yeah, you, you have you, a law firm in Ukraine, eh? or your. I, I work with attorneys in Ukraine, and yeah. I'm also yeah. um, chief legal officer of a big development house there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, because they had no history in a sense, you know, they can start from scratch. They can say, you know, we're going to put property on the blockchain, which they're trying to do right now. Okay. You know, Western Europe and the United States, in the same way, is different because we have an uninterrupted history mm. and records and systems that are built up over time yeah. that we all didn't throw away in 1991. No, so, no blank sheet. Uh, we're not. And, you know, it's, it's the price you pay for success. I mean, you know, the... 
you know, World War II or not, the yeah. Netherlands has had a continuous society for for centuries now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and so is the U.S. You know, it sounds funny to say, but we've had a continuous country for centuries now. You know, so when you have a continuous country for centuries, mm -hmm. you you can't just throw out the law and what happened before. You're not in that position. So, okay. but you have the advantage of the history, but you also have the, the weight of history. If you mm. um, take Africa, for example, they are kind of in a similar situation to the way Eastern Europe was. They, they were able to bypass phone yeah. lines entirely and go straight to mobile because they, they could. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, everything has a cost, everything has a pro and a con. Okay, a few questions. Sure. Um, uh, about the U.S., has the Trump administration any influence on this development in the blockchain space? I have to say, not that oh. I can see. The, um, mm. No mean, difference with well, the I'll former. do my Trump edition. No, nothing huge. Ooge. <laughs> and look at these hands. No, um, that's the whole thing he said. The, um, yeah. I mean, w w whether you like him or not, he doesn't seem particularly engaged in this topic. I don't know if he knows w what Bitcoin or Ethereum is. I don't know if he needs to know what they are. The, um, Does he have bitcoins? I don't, yeah, we don't know. We don't care. I don't know. And if I sold them, if I sold them <laughs> to him, I wouldn't say it on, on video. No, I, I honestly don't know. But uh, the, the things I'm yeah. looking at are the, the, what I focus on in the U.S. is how are the regulators acting. Okay. So the, the, SEC. the, the SEC, the CFTC, which is uh, Commodities and Futures Trading Commission. So okay. th there's... SEC does securities, mm -hmm. and CFTC does commodities, commodities but it okay. also does derivatives and futures. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. So, the CFTC has stated that Bitcoin, not everything else, but Bitcoin is money, but not a currency, which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting, and it's claimed jurisdiction over Bitcoin futures, which is different from options. Yeah. It gets all complicated. You know, and there, there's there a, are futures in place, and the uh, Chicago, uh, you know, it, SBOE, I, yeah. I honestly can't quite tell because they seem to be granted and seem to be taken away. And I'm serious, I can't okay. look, it, it's all I may also not be perfectly up to date, but I just mm. heard something about you know, see if he basically just stopped someone else from doing it. I don't know. I read some news about mm. you know, these are going to start to be traded uh, okay. about a month ago. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't been super following it, I've been more on the ICO path because that's kind of where everyone's going right now but yeah. the, mm. but now I'm getting more drawn into the CFTC side there's, there's so much what's, what's interesting about this area of law is it covers so many things there's international there's tax securities commodities it's just all over the place okay okay we just have to um, uh, one last thing uh, do you have current uh, cryptocurrencies yourself trading uh, I definitely have, yes I do okay I also have tokens and my point of view on that stuff is I have a good buddy who said don't pay retail so I, I try to get that stuff by adding value okay. and then getting compensation back but uh, I have spent fiat for crypto okay 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 are you enthusiastic about some some of these currencies uh, maybe a particular one um, or you just invest and huddle you know the, someone wiser than me said that you can't value these cryptocurrencies you can only price them you okay. can't value them, you can only price them. It's Matter because, of trust. Not even trust, it's just that you, they're, because there's no, you know, the good thing about them is they don't have a government behind them. The bad thing about them is they don't have a government behind them. Mm. It's a pro and a con, and that, that's an intentional design choice by Satoshi going forward. Mm. You know, there, there's not, there's no, if Bitcoin cheats me, there's no one I can sue. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But yeah. that's good and that's bad. That, that's part of why it survived, that there's no one you can sue. Mm. Like, you mm. can't arrest Bitcoin. Okay, you know, you can't stick Bitcoin in jail. No, there's no person. There's no, you know, or if he is, he's, no, no, office. he's off on Mars with Elon Musk or something. The, you can't value it. You, you, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have earnings. It doesn't have board directors. It doesn't have a product plan, you know, in a sense. You can only price it, and the pricing is to function the market. So, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't value it. I can only price it. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You. Okay. Appreciate yes. it. Yes. Thanks.